um, there was the, the, the Gonski review in the Education Commission by the Federal Government, there was the Henry review in the Tax Commission by the Federal Government, but the Boring review in the media <laughs> probably wasn't a label or a moniker that either the industry or the government were after. And apologies, apologies to my father and my ancestors for that. <laughs> so, what is convergence? And I describe this practically by taking a reflection on what happened in my own home, in my own life over the last 10 years. And the way that I used to access media was fixed and dedicated. Television started sat in the lounge room, the radio uh, sat on the mantelpiece, the phone sat on the kitchen bench, and for those of you old enough to remember, the paper arrived in the thud on the veranda and it was delivered um, quite novelly by person. And uh, as I say, Richard, the, the young chap that introduced me, um, some of us were old enough to actually remember paperboards, which was my first job. But this was the way that the media was to the newspapers. It was all very neat, it was all very clear, and it was all very distinct. Now, fast forward to today, and we have this phenomenon of media convergence on a single device, and probably the best example that we all have today is a tablet PC or an iPad. I can watch video, I can listen to radio, I can read the newspaper, I can communicate with family, friends and business associates, and I can do all that mobile, at a mobile basis virtually from anywhere. And that's at the heart what convergence is about. IT people understand this, any to any, virtually any content to virtually any device. Now, before I get into some of the internal aspects of regulation and what the review did, I should say right up front that this phenomenon of convergence in the media is absolutely wonderful. It is terrific. It has provided consumers with new services. It has provided us all with new flexibility. It has provided the industry with opportunities. And as I say often about technology, you do wonder how we survived in an era before these services were made available to us. So, is there a problem with such a, a wonderful array of services and opportunities? Is there an issue? Why did the government go to the trouble of commissioning and spending taxpayers' dollars on a convergence review? Now, I've tried to summarise a very complex set of issues simplistically into a single chart. And on the left of this chart, it represents the way the industry was structured in 2000, with the vast majority of our media being delivered by traditional means. By that, I mean over the airwaves television, over the airwaves radio, some cable TV, and newspapers delivered, as the name suggests, by paper. The government regulated the industry, defined the industry on this basis by the way it happened to deliver the service to you as distinct from actually what the service did. And there were specific acts of parliament, I won't go into all of them, but the most obvious was the Broadcasting Services Act of 1992 that started off at 200 pages and is today over a thousand pages as governments and legislators have tried desperately to keep up and keep current with technical trends. Fast forward to 2020, and the world is turned on its head. I read an article in the newspaper recently from the respected media uh, executive, Harold Mitchell, where he said by 2020, 85% of our media will be digital. Um, nobody knows whether that's accurately correct, but I think we all acknowledge it is directionally correct. And as represented on the right of this chart, that means that without change, much of our media would, exist, would miss the existing regulatory net. The rules will be ineffective, they'll often uh, be unenforceable, and for those still in that smaller slice of the pie called the traditional delivery space, the rules will be un increasingly unfair and unequal. A practical example, and we've got colleagues from Free TV here today, but a practical example is to look at free to air television stations in Australia who have traditionally had significant regulation regarding Australian content, local content, things like community standards. 
Yet today, a new entrant could enter our market. It could provide a service that is for all intents and purposes identical to the consumer as a channel 7, 9 or 10. And it could deliver that service complete, relatively completely free of obligation simply because of the happenstance of how you happen to receive the product. So if it was delivered via the internet, largely free of regulation, delivered via this radio frequency spectrum over the airwaves, uh, it is regulated. So, so that leaves you with all, lots and lots of issues, but it leaves you with a rather stark starting point, which is either to abolish everything and bring the traditional media into the world of the new media, or change the way we do things, recalibrate regulation and think about what's important. So what, what did the review do? I won't go into this in any detail, you can read the chart, but I will say a couple of things. Um, we met with all of the major, major media companies, I would acknowledge some of them are here today, the traditional media engaged early and well and hard. Um, we met with the, the chief executives of, of, of the major commercial television stations, for example, um, Mark Scott is here today for the ABC, um, Michael's predecessor for SBS. So the traditional media engaged, it is fair to say that the new media tried to avoid the reality, I think, of the convergence of the for some time and hoped that perhaps Louise and Malcolm and I didn't notice that there was this phenomenon. And that did change after the release of our annual report. We met with community, uh, we met with industry associations, Jeff Brown from Spa was here, Julie Flynn from Free Community Australia was here, and we met with community organisations like those representing the interests of children in our media. We toured Australia, we went out to Alice Springs, we went to Bendigo, and we ended up receiving some 2,700 pages of submissions, so something like uh, three telephone books, for those old enough to remember. Um, <laughs> crucially, we were asked to consider two concurrent reports. The first was relatively straightforward, and it was in our square spot, which was a national classification review. But the other was the independent media inquiry, the inquiry led by um, uh, Justice Craig Finkelstein. It is fair to say that the independent media inquiry come to the convergence review out of left field. Um, journalistic standards in the print press was not central to our original brief. But both the government and then us as a review had to work on our feet. Uh, with what was playing out in the UK, with the focus on uh, print press, focus on ethics, and the review that was then commissioned. And it is fair to say that one of the things that I am trying to do as I go back and talk about the Convergence Review is to highlight that it is not all about journalistic standards in the print press. There is a whole lot of 90% of our report that's worth talking about. There was also one other important learning from our consultations, and that is this. There were two very distinct constituencies as we spoke to people. The first was the industry, who were understandably pushing for less regulation, less cost, more freedom to operate, and addressing a lot of the very important issues with an organised and forceful voice that were often industrial. And I don't mean that in any way negative, they were crucially important issues. But the industry was looking, as I would if I was in their shoes, of what could we do to improve the way we operate. But there was also the Australian public, the 24 million of us that are consumers of the media. And they weren't so concerned, again understandably, about the inner workings of media companies about licence fees, about trigger events, about tax rebates, about compliance costs. But they had a different focus that was equally important to the views of the industry. And I'll talk about that on the next chart. So we started from the position of why regulate the law. Um, it, 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 many of you in the room will know um, my background. I come from 25 years of IBM. Um, IBM is one of the great success stories of global capitalism. IBM has argued for reducing trade barriers, for opening up the world, the internet, making it a borderless world. So I'm not a regulator by training or instinct. So we started with a deregulatory stance. 
And the first port of call was to look at the existing body of work and what we could abolish. Um, I'll list some of these as we go through um, as I go through the charts. But the, the one of the things we said, and perhaps in many ways to us the most symbolic, was the abolition of board, uh, the need for a broadcast license in Australia. Um, the idea that you, if you wanted to broadcast, you had to go to the government. They then did an analysis on the type of broadcasting you were going to do, and then they did an analysis on broadcast areas, and you may or may not have been given permission. This comes from an era of, spare, of scarce public spectrum. When it was given out on a license basis, because there was only so much of it to give out. Clearly no longer valid, clearly irrelevant in a world of high speed broadband and propensity. When anybody, as we know, and I'll talk about social media and other things, can broadcast. But after starting on this first point of the deregulatory footing, we found that there were three enduring priorities that convergence had changed everything, but three things remained sound. And they were the importance of diversity and media ownership, minimum content standards, and the support for Australian content. And I'll speak to each of those in some detail. So that's why regulate. Then, who should be regulated? And the first two bullets of this chart were, were very fundamental to our ultimate findings. And the first is, there is no dispute that convergence has dramatically changed how we access our media. And I gave an iPad as a device example earlier, but it's more than just a device. For example, we today may access media via Facebook or Twitter. Um, I expect that the, that the younger people in the audience who are um, supporters of the ACS Foundation, they probably, I shouldn't research them, there's probably an ACS Foundation Facebook interest group. Yep, I'm getting nods from the back of the room. So you may be part of that interest group, somebody may post something and say, Hey, take a look at this. But when you click the link, the originator, the source of that media, remains overwhelmingly the large Australian trusted media group. So you click the link and it takes you to an article in the Sydney Morning Herald. It may take you to an article in ABC Online. It might take you to a video clip from Channel 10. So how we are accessing the media has changed dramatically, but the sources from which we're getting it from has changed far less so. So we recommended a concept called Content Service Certified. It is a clunky name. You should have hired a marketing firm to go out and find a sexier name for us, but we didn't. But, but we thought this was a clear way of, who, of defining who should be regulated and why. A couple of key points. Professional content only. Control content only. We clearly excluded social media and user generated content. We said that to be defined as a content service set enterprise, it is based on Australian audience, there's a scale criteria, Australian audience and Australian content revenue, and we said there's a scope criteria. It simply meant if you don't do Australian content, you're not subject to those obligations. If you don't do news, you're not subject to those obligations. And we deliberately set out, which was something that did distinguish us from the independent media inquiry, we set out to set a deliberately high bar. And in our report, we proposed some thresholds that will be debated. But those thresholds would have, in today's topology, 15 substantial media organisations in Australia defined as content service enterprise. So that's who should be regulated. Then the next thing we faced was who does the regulation? And we recommended two distinct bodies. And this is a really important point, and I'll, I'll come back to this later in the presentation. But one is a government statutory authority. Um, it's effectively a replacement for the current ACMA. Um, Charles was here for the ACMA. I want to say publicly, I've said it repeatedly. Um, this recommendation should not be seen as a criticism of the ACMA or its people. Um, the ACMA itself acknowledged the challenges it faced with an ineffective toolkit, quite frankly. It's operated with, and it produced, which is a 
reframing the Tuas, so a very uh, important paper last year called Broken Concepts. We've taken that Broken Concepts paper a step further, and it is probably a step further than the existing authority that ultimately the industrial port government could go. And we've said that not, do we not just need to address the Broken Concepts, that we need a fundamentally different regulatory model. One where the regulator is truly at arm's length to the government, the government sets strong principles, it sets frameworks, and it has oversight, clear oversight of the independent regulator. But then the regulator has some freedom to implement those rules in an ever-changing world. Um, but, it, but in terms of thinking about a, a government body that is truly independent, uh, probably the best thing I can do is say, think of the Reserve Bank of Australia, think of the ACCC, who clearly put under enormous pressure in, a, in an election cycle to reduce interest rates or in a merger cycle to approve a transaction, but operate independently based on principles at arm's length of the government. In addition to this, we recommended a separate and equal body, one that is industry led for standards regarding news and commentary. And we were faced with a very stark choice. From a convergence review perspective, you can no longer justify that print news and commentary is different to TV news and commentary. And that's the way it exists today in the regulatory environment. Print news is self-regulated, radio and TV news is government regulated. Now, the fact is, it is often the same journalists uh, say uh, an Annabelle Crabbe, David Spears, and Laurie Oates, saying something on television, and then identically that day or the next day saying the same thing in an opinion piece in the print news. Further, the distinction between what is a newspaper and what is a television, what is video, has changed. If I go on the City Morning Herald website today, every print article will be preceded with a video clip. If I go into the Sky News website today, each of their video clips of their television program will have a print article attached. The lines are blurred. So how do you bring this together? And the stark reality that we were faced with was if you accept the convergence has brought these mediums together, you either take print, from print standards from self-regulation, and move it to the government, or you do the reverse, and you take news and commentary standards for TV and radio, and you move it to the industry. And we took the deregulatory move to shift TV and radio news standards to the industry. Um, let me now dive in quickly to each of the three issues that I teed up earlier in the chart. Um, Diversity of opinion, particularly in news and commentary, is at the heart of a healthy democracy. And we concluded that diversity of ownership continues to underpin that. Um, there was an argument that ownership restrictions should be just completely abandoned, um, that the internet had democratised the world, that it wouldn't, that at the extreme, it didn't matter anymore if one entity owned all of the media in Australia because I could always go and Google and search for a different point of view somewhere else in the world. That argument, frankly, didn't fit with the reality that Australians still go, as I said earlier, to large trusted local brands for their news. And we thought, even with the undoubted explosion in information out there from the internet, that having media owned by multiple entities remained an important safeguard to a free and open democracy. So we recommended a couple of things. We recommended the, that there is an existing numerical rule um, called the Voices Rule, 4-5 uh, rule, will be updated. This rule covers local markets. So say in Sydney, the rule today says there must be five distinct voices in the Sydney media region media market. Voices is actually an overly cute word because when you get underneath it, it's actually owners. So we've said update that. But one of the things we found was that in that definition today, it excluded national newspapers, it excluded uh, pay television, it excluded websites. So in this, when, when people look at the Sydney media market, um, it interestingly didn't include um, publications like the Australian, 
uh, broadcasters like Foxtel as a voice in the Sydney market. So we said contemporise it, recognise that there is a new topology and update that work. And then we said on a very limited basis, we propose the introduction of the public interest test for, for just the major mergers and acquisitions. And our argument was this draws two flaws within the current system. The first, the whole topology today of media ownership is based on this anachronism of local areas. And there are no media specific ownership laws at a national level. Um, and clearly that was fine 20 years ago when broadcast areas were defined by how far you could throw your signal. But in an internet-enabled world, when I can read anything from anywhere in Australia, or watch virtually anything from anywhere in Australia, that needed to change. The second issue was there, the, the ACCC plays a very valued and important role in approving and blocking mergers, but it does it solely on a pure economic competition basis. It's a very dry, important, the dry analysis. And it has long been recognised, going back to the Productivity Commission review in the year 2000, it has long been recognised in the media that competition issues and diversity issues are related but different. So what we're proposing is a public interest test that could consider non-economic considerations. And at the extreme example, again, just to make my point, a merger could potentially pass the ACCC for competition at a national level, but it could trash a range of services to Australian consumers. And that's a situation that we think should be closed by a public interest test. Um, let me move to content standards. I've covered a lot of this on that chart about the two bodies that regulate. So I'll just make a couple of points. First of all, it was clear to us that Australians still do expect, they expect minimum content standards in the media. They, we expect to protect our children from inappropriate content. We expect to have a classification scheme that informs consumers. And we want to have a reason to trust and be confident that there is accuracy in our news and in our news and commentary. So the key point for the stat new statutory body is that a single all media classification board covering all platforms will be established as recommended to us by the classification uh, review. Simply put, this is common sense, saying that a piece of content is classified, if it needs to be classified, it's classified once, and that covers the platform. Some of you may be surprised that today, if a movie is classified, for example, um, the classification is different across platforms. So a movie that is shown at the theatre is classified differently than is shown on television or on the internet. And we're just normalising that and making it both easier, I think, for the industry, but certainly easier for consumers to understand. But then the second major point is regarding this news and commentary industry-led body. Um, there, these are a couple of particularly controversial uh, points to the print industry. The first is, we've said, if you are one of the 15 major news providers in the country, you have to be a member of this body. Um, you can self-regulate, you can set your own codes, you can set your own sanctions, you can do everything you want, but the environment that exists today where a media company can say, I will be a member of today's body, which is the Australian Press Council, I will do that voluntarily, and then invariably it's a regulator you get a couple of adjudications, which is its job. You get a few adjudications that you don't like. This concept that you can then say, well, look, I agreed to play by those rules. I agreed to be part of this body. But you know what? I now no longer recognise the jurisdiction of this court. And not only am I leaving this body, but I'm also um, making a power statement in that I'm, I'm removing my funding from you on an ongoing basis isn't an unacceptable loophole. So we've said, you can self-regulate, you can make your own rules, you can be responsible, but you've got to play in your own system. Um, the other two issues, we had put to us by the existing press council that they thought there should be two um, options available to them. The first was that a body should have access to limited government funding. 
um, majority funded by the industry. But for example, the, the, the body may say to government, we've got a special project in the national interest, and we think you should contribute to that. Um, an example might be, if, if our proposals are implemented, it will be an enormous piece of work to bring uh, TV and radio standards into this body. There may be significant one-time costs in doing that. There may be significant educational costs in doing that. And the body would have the right to say to the government, it's not fair to burden us with that. It is in the national interest to contribute. The second is, the press council said, we think we'd like the option that if all else would fail, if we had a recalcitrant member with whom we'd applied all of our sanctions, all of our effort, and then making our industry look bad, we may want the opportunity to refer that to government. Um, and we included that as an option. But the fundamentally important point that's been missed in a lot of the commentary about this, because there have been people that have said the minute the government fund a, a, a self-regulatory body, it has become corrupt. The minute there's government money in there, there's government calls in there. Others have said the power to refer up it's really a backdoor way to some statutory government influence on the free press and the, and, and, and the news. The thing that has been missed is that what all we are recommending is giving the new industry body these options. It is up to the industry. The industry can come together in this new body. It can say we want to absolutely rule out ever accessing any public money. We think that is compromising us. They can do that. They can make them take that new money. Similarly, when they come together and build their constitution, they can say, we were offered the opportunity to refer, but we're never going to do that. We want to explicitly rule it out, because we want to handle everything within house, and if we get a terrible recalcitrant member, we'll figure it out amongst ourselves. Um, so that's uh, content standards. The next is Australian content. Now, Support for Australian content has been a bipartisan and continuous feature of our political and media landscape for over 50 years, and it is widely recognised. I, I think it's largely beyond dispute that there's a market failure that exists for the production and distribution of Australian content. Now, what do I mean by market failure? Uh, to just illustrate this, a quality uh, Australian TV drama, something like An Underbelly, A Pack of the Rafters, The Stuff, Costs in the vicinity of a million to one and a half million dollars an hour to make. On the other hand, to buy an already produced overseas quality drama, say something in the CSI type genre, um, to buy that from a bigger market where it's already been produced, the profits being recouped, the initial investments covered, it's about 200k an hour. So clearly, if we were only running to nothing but a profit mode, if, if I was the chief executive or chairman of any of the commercial freeway networks, ultimately, if you're looking at saying, I can buy a cheap product with a much bigger profit margin, and the revenue I get from advertising is in the same bandwidth, maybe a bit less, but it's in the same bandwidth, you would do that. Um, I wanted to test this because it, it, it's maybe well known, it's at least to some of, you, some of my colleagues have been there, but I've chaired Screen Australia for the last four years and therefore am part of the pro Australian content um, group. So I thought it appropriate to test this to make sure that um, collectively that we weren't um, living off our own, uh, our own uh, agenda. So we went out and got PwC and, and the team here today came in with Damien and Rina. And we said to PwC, and this is a very respected group in this sector, they, um, they publish the annual media and entertainment outlook that's anticipated by the industry. We said to them, tell us what would happen. Just, just please do your, your forecasting of what would happen if government support to the Australian uh, content industry was removed. And the findings were both startling and frightening in equal effects. What, it, what they said was, Australian TV, Australian children's television on TV in the commercial space will cease to exist and go to zero. They told us that documentaries would halve. And the one that probably surprised me the most, because you think of Australian adult dramas and the crawling brands, the, the Pack of the Rafters and the Underbellies and that sort of thing. 
Uh, but adult trauma would drop by 90% without government intervention. So there is this market failure. By the way, that market failure doesn't exist for Australian sport and use. It has a natural protection of it being live and local. Um, but it is dramatic. So that was what we were faced with. Then we said, looked at the existing topology and regulation and said, the blunders interim instrument that the commercial networks are faced with today is a 55% quota for Australian content between 9 a.m. and midnight. At 6 a.m. and midnight. And we looked at that and said, a quota like that was logical 20 years ago when really the free to airs and the ABC and SBS were the only game in town. So if the free to airs put out 55%, as a consumer, we absorbed 55%. Because there weren't a lot of other options. But that type of blood instru instrument would become increasingly unworkable and unfair into the future. So we said move to a uniform content scheme. This is something that has been missed in a lot of the commentary. And what we said was if you meet thresholds for professional Australian video content, audience and revenue base, then you must invest. A relatively small amount, we, we modelled it at about 3%, in Australian content targeted to three endangered species, being adult drama, being children's and being documentaries. Now, unfortunately, and, and that is platform neutral. If you're an internet company that enters Australia with IP TV, if you're a subscription television, if you're free to wear, it's platform neutral. Now, one of the hurdles we faced was the advice we got from the government was that could be implemented, that scheme, with the political will and uh, momentum, but it required a renegotiation of the USA-Australia Free Trade Agreement. And the advice we got was that could be done, absolutely, but it would take some time. There's a scheduling of these things that package up a whole series of um, negotiations with the Americans, and it would take some time. So we recommended in the interim, as a transitional arrangement, the 55% quota be maintained, frankly recognising the terrific job that the free West sector do in this space and their importance in underpinning Australian production. We recommended a targeted increase in the three endangered species genre, children's diamond dockers, and I'll discuss this in a moment. Um, the network said to us, that they would like flexibility in meeting those obligations on their digital multi-channel. So as it, as it stands today, all the obligations are on the one main channel and none on the digital channels. Um, people like Channel 10 rightly come to us and said, we're showing neighbours on 11 and we're getting no credit for it. Um, some of the networks come to us and said, we can't monetize children's content. It's by definition a limited audience and it's by definition restricted advertising. On our mainline channel, if we could move it to a multi-channel, it would actually be worth money to us because we could put higher ad-generating programming on a more popular mainline channel. So we said you could, we, we recommended that flexibility. We then said, in addition to that, to support this, we would move the producer offset, the tax break you get for creating television content, from 20% to 40%. Um, our logic was to bring it in line with feature film. If you make a $15 million feature film in Australia, you get a 40% tax break on Australian content. It, did, it seemed the logical to us if you made uh, a, a drama of 10 one-hour episodes of $1.5 million each of equal quality, that you weren't eligible for the right break, so that's what we recommended. And we extended the obligations on pay television that actually had no requirements for children to doctors, it was only adult drama, we extended it to that. Now, it, I should say, um, it was put to the committee that there was logic behind doubling pay TV's obligations from 10 to 20 percent. Um, it was way before my time, but we were advised that when pay TV set up, it was originally designed to be 20, but 10 was put in as an interim measure as that, as that sector matured. And it was also put to us that when the Australian-US Free Trade Agreement was negotiated, digital multi-channels were contemplated. And in fact, there was a provision there to put a 55% quota on the second, on the second channel. Um, we concluded they were both very blunt instruments with very significant costs to the industry. 
and we did something again that I'll touch on that was a little more, uh, I think, you perhaps user friendly. Other matters, Spectrum, uh, today broadcast licenses and Spectrum licenses come together. We said make break that connection, which ultimately will allow broadcasters to distribute the content any way they wish. Um, we said for the move, so today the broadcasters, hit the commercial free aware, um, pay an arbitrary tax on gross earnings as a license fee, and we said move that to market based pricing. We said give the existing spectrum holders the ability to trade spectrum. This is something that hasn't been picked up widely, but I think could have significant implications. And we've also said there's spare spectrum that was always held over by the government for a sixth commercial network, a sixth network, or a fourth commercial network. And we've said no, don't do that. But experiment by allowing that space, um, individual channels to come into that space that may add diversity and innovation to our TV landscape. And then we've got um, both Mark and Michael here from uh, ABC and SBS. We said two things about those organisations. One, bring the charters up to date. It was put to us quite directly that the ABC, its charter, which I think was 1983 or 82, um, the ABC charter that was implemented in, uh, in the early 80s um, makes no mention of it, not surprisingly, of online. So it's put to us, the ABC were actually operating outside of their charter because they're online. So our recommendation was simply to contemporise the charter um, and recognise the footprint that both ABC and SBS had. And then we took a, that was a principal decision to say, as a transitional measure, if you're going to have commercial TV stepping up to 55%, you should have the publicly funded broadcaster stepping up to 55%. And to a lesser extent, because it's got a different mission um, with, 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 a, with the SBS, that it should be at half that rate. Um, I wanted to use this, and I, and I said this is the first, other than um, doing some press interviews, um, this is the first public opportunity I've had to make some comment. And setting the record straight for the first point is true, but making comment. Um, when, a couple of days before our report, release, there was a front page article um, on the, in the Australian, uh, and it said, it was an exclusive, saying that the Convergence Review was going to recommend a retired judge with the ability to find the print press. Um, that was just totally and utterly horribly wrong. Um, in fact, as I pointed out, I think you can find uh, that we might have some of the Australian, but as I pointed out to the Australian, uh, I knew what was in the report. If you did a word search on the 200 page PDF document, the word find and the two words retired judge don't appear once. Do you know? Yeah. So um, then it was, I, I, I said to the words, it sort of felt like people were playing, it was a bit like um, Led Zeppelin's Stairway to Heaven. People were playing the report backwards and trying to, <laughs> trying to see if they'd get any, any devil music to come out of it. Because, then it was that the government had the power to direct the new standard body. Not, not the case. The government regulator sits above the new standard body. Not the case. The, the only place that this could have possibly been interpreted, as I say, reading the report upside down, played backwards, was in one area where we said the government regulator should be able to ask, ask, not refer, direct, impose, but ask, the news body to investigate a complaint. And we had a very innocent intention behind that. It is well known where you complain to in the print press. You write a letter to the editor. It is less well known where you complain to in the broadcast press. The industry do a really good job trying to get the message out of putting community service ads. But Australian consumers don't always know if I see something I don't like on television, do I go to the outlet, do I go to the industry association, do I go to my local member, do I go to the government regulator? So we anticipated that during transition, significant complaints would still be misdirected to the government regulator and there'd be a mechanism to pass them across to the industry. Then the other one was we were creating a super regulator with all sorts of kind of, you know, um, imposing implications. The report actually says that we think, as a result of what we're recommending, it will be a smaller but better tuned regulator, and it will be more effective as a result of that. We say that 
we're abolishing significant rules. We say that we're moving lots of work to the industry. And it may be super in better, but not super in any negative connotation. The other one was that we, that we let the internet players off the hook, you know, outraged. And all I can do is quote directly from the report, and I do. If a new internet, internet delivered service grew revenue and audience comparable with today's TV broadcasters, it would have like obligations. That's in the first few pages of the report and repeated throughout. The other one is, I think, an, an issue for Australia um, beyond the media. And that's this sort of shrug the shoulders conclusion that you can no longer regulate in an in, in internet enabled world, that we no longer have international sovereignty. That it's over, the internet has brought borders down, we have no ability to do anything that we think is important locally, that, that's all over. And I fundamentally disagree with that conclusion. I, I worked for 25 years with IBM, IBM are in, IBM are in 170 countries. We comply with local laws in every country, including complex laws, tax laws, IR laws, advertising laws. Um, international banks operate in Australia in a very complicated financial service market. Different in every country, local obligations in every country, they can figure it out. Um, I'm not saying that this is easy. Um, there's been some stuff in the press in the last few days about Google and tax rates, and I don't want to buy into that. I'm not saying this is easy, it needs to be thoughtful because there can be unintended consequences. But the idea that we just give up national sovereignty as a result of technical change, I don't agree with. And then finally, um, there was some comment that the Australian content transitional obligations were unreasonable. Let me try and just put both sides of the argument and come to where we fell. The free to air TV um, networks and the industry association say they, that the free to air networks spend $1.2 billion a year on Australian content. That's more than ever before, and it's better quality than ever before. And I wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, the first two are matters of fact, the third one is subjective, but it's one that I wholeheartedly agree with. However, many submissions to us, so, so that argument is an absolute one. More than ever before, better than ever before. Many submissions to us, and in the paper, in the report, we can quote the Communications Law Centre, and there are many others who said, but wait a minute, there's been a dilution effect. And it's a bit like it's a, if I could use the analogy, a bit like Dick Smith in the supermarkets with Australian cans on shelves. Dick Smith would say, look, there was six cans on the shelf before. There's six cans there today. So we agree with that. But the supermarket shelf space has tripled, and the Australian content, therefore, has been diluted as a result of that. Both the arguments are correct. They're just looking at the one set of facts from different sides of the equation. So what we decided to do was to propose a very targeted recommendation that said increase the sub quotas for documentaries, children and drama by 50%. Now, 50% you rock back, I would too, if I was presented on this recommendation. The modelling that was done suggests that's $30 million in additional costs. So $1.2 billion spent a day, $30 million in additional requirements, it's about 3%. For that, there is a proposal to double the tax break from 20 to 40. Um, for that, there is a proposal to allow flexibility on meeting those obligations that should have monetary benefit. And although, and I touched on this with Julia earlier, although it is an unrelated but connected issue, there is a discussion to be had about the ongoing level of licence fees during a transitional period. So I hope that there are the building blocks there and there are people that support and oppose. And I hope that there are the building blocks there for a discussion where the networks could come out with a solution that is financially sensitive and viable to them, but the Australian production sector could come out with support for projects and, and product of particular importance to it. So I'll wrap up. Um, only regulate where there's a clear public interest. So I think diversity of ownership content standards and Australian content is largely uncontested. It's just how. There's a few outliers on the fringe, but I think that's largely uncontested. 
um, create a framework that could last 20 years. The near existing legislation is 20 years old, so we will be tasked with the unenviable challenge of trying to figure out a technology neutral framework that would last a couple of decades, include only the largest organisations, as a 90 10 rule, abolish an extensive list of existing rules, move user commentary to the industry. And then the thing that I get asked most often is, Glenn, you spend a year of your life doing this. Um, what do you think the government are going to do? The reason I have no idea, it's with the government, and no one has no idea, it's with the government. Um, we're not naive enough to think that they're going to cut and paste our 200 page um, escapade and sit that in the legislation at all. We think this will create a debate. Um, we think it will be a lightning rod for everybody on either side of the argument. But the thing that gives me some confidence is that ultimately there is no option for Australia but to act. If you think diversity of ownership in our media is important, if you think community standards in our media is important, if you think Australian content is important, there is ultimately no option but to act. Thank you. Questions? John is going to come up and pick me up.